Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Greetings, listeners, to Rhonda Turbin's Radio Journal. And I am just reading into this journal a recent short book I wrote about the crisis in the church. And this is day four in that manuscript. I'm up to page 51. So you won't understand a word of what I'm trying to do unless you actually go to the earlier chapters or earlier days as... um, as spelled out in the contents of these programs. So I started a few weeks ago doing this. So this is Chapter 4, which is called Day 4, Scriptures in Context versus Scriptures as Normative, and Roles, Feminism versus Complementarity. And here is the morning session, and our semi-fictional Father Doria says this. I am so happy to see all of you this week. I'm praying that good insights are making it worth your while, and especially that the Holy Spirit may be teaching us in ways we may not have expected. Today's morning topic, as all of you who are theologians surely know, is as controversial as any of the others. On this topic, the extremes of the divisions among all Christians about scripture as literal or not. Some are absolute fundamentalist literalists, especially the scripture passages which they take to define the type of Christianity they believe in or they believe is the best as well. An example would be the scripture, call no man's father, Matthew 23, 9, used by some Christian groups to prove that Catholics are disobedient to Jesus since we call our priests father. Yet St. Paul calls himself a father of the faithful, 1 Corinthians 4, And few fundamentalist literalists refuse to call their birth or adopted fathers by the name Father. Sayings of Jesus, such as call men, no men father, were not meant to be rules of speech, as if Jesus never called Joseph father. Rather, he was teaching us about the primacy of the fatherhood of God. And others would be in the extreme about the interpretation of scripture by teaching us that everything is myth and that this is good. Now, in scholarly circles, the word myth doesn't mean something false as it does in ordinary language. It means that what is thought to be a literal historical idea is really something symbolic. An extreme example would be those who teach that the accounts of the resurrection are not about a physical resurrection, but instead our Christian myth about the experience of the rebirth of the soul when it reaches deeper levels of union with God. But I would say that even if the resurrection is a myth in the sense not of false but only symbolic, then Christianity ceases to be a historical religion and becomes simply one among many symbolic systems. Now, does that mean that if we ever look into the context of a scriptural text, we are violating its literal meaning, or that we are in danger of understanding it only as a symbol? Hardly. I'm happy to read scholars who explain the context of Jesus condemning the guest at the wedding who wasn't wearing a wedding garment, Matthew 22, 11 through 12, It is explained that at weddings of that time, all the guests received the garment on entering the banquet hall. 
so that guest would have to have taken it off. I was happy to hear once that when Jesus tells the woman who was not Jewish that she was like a dog who doesn't get the food of the children, Matthew 15, 26, that this was a known form of banter at that time. The first speaker says something outrageous to call out a humorous response, such as the woman gives about the dogs at the table eating the scraps. I'm happy to read that the word for brothers at the time of Jesus included cousins, which explains why mention is made of the brothers of Jesus in several places, while we Catholics and some other Christians believe he was an only child. On the other hand, I'm not happy when some scripture scholars seem to use context to eviscerate the meaning, as in claiming that Jesus only uses the word father about the first person of the Trinity because his culture was patriarchal. Now here is your question for this morning's group session. In what ways does context help you understand scripture? In what ways do you think it is normative that has a meaning that transcends cultures and eras and is true for all Christians for all times? At the table, Rhonda, I have never studied hermeneutics, but you have, James. Give me enough of a definition of terms so that I can express myself more clearly about it. James, hermeneutics is the interpretation of texts, mostly biblical ones. In Catholic theology, we distinguish four senses that can be found in scriptures. The literal, but still that includes something of the historical context, such as what the word brother meant in the languages of the New Testament. The moral, such as how Moses was commanded by God to break the stones on which the commandments were written to punish the people for their idolatry. The allegorical, as in something like Noah's Ark is a type of the church in the New Testament. And then the anagogical, a mystical interpretation, such as the analysis of numbers in the Bible and the Kabbalah. Rhonda, I find that most Catholic preparationists get confused by this. They don't always see clearly which passages in the New Testament are literal and which are more allegorical. So I like to refer to Flannery O'Connor's unusual way to refute the literal fundamentalism of many of the the Protestant churches in the South where she lived. She wrote a famous short story about a man who is convinced that since he has so much lust, he must literally pluck out his eye. James laughed. On the other hand, I've never met any Catholics except strong, strong Franciscan friars who literally only have one piece of clothing, as Jesus claims the disciples should do with. James, of course, much harder to understand is in what way the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist is not merely symbolic in the allegorical sense, but clearly doesn't mean literal cannibalism as the Romans sometimes denounced the early Christians for practicing. Rhonda, right. But then, is it because they think of the Eucharist as merely symbolic that so few Catholics believe in the famous that the famous Eucharistic miracles such as Lanciano, Orvieto, the Poland, Batania, and recently in Buenos Aires, Argentina. In the last case, a host that had been discarded by a recipient and found on the floor showed itself to be real blood that scientists, including an atheist, identified as from the same person as that of the centuries-old Lanciano miracle. James. I do not think of the Eucharist as merely symbolic, but rather as the apex of how God is omnipresent in everything. But to diverge a moment, I wanted to bring up something that has been bothering me in the start of this seminar, Rhonda. Even though Father Doria was careful to not limit the spectrum he devised for liberals and conservatives, do not not limit it to liberals versus conservatives. 
The way the topics are set up reminds me of the opening I sometimes use in my contemporary theology classes. And this is a quote from John E. Sr. I fear sometimes that conservatives, not just liberals, are like the Pharisee Catholics, but with a strong, unloving determination to be right, whereas the Camino Real of Christ is a chivalric way, romantic, full of fire and passion, riding on the pure, high-spirited horses of the self with their glad, high-stepping knees and flaring nostrils, and with jingling spurs and the cry, Mon joie, the battle cry of Roland and Oliver. Our church is the church of passion. Or to put it another way, I don't approach God or the church in terms of divisions about various topics, but rather in a mystical way. I want to dwell in God in such a way that I am more and more living on earth out of his presence to his creation. So if some line in scripture stands out for me, it is not in terms of proof texting, but more as something to draw me deeper into the heart of God. Rhonda, well, of course that's beautiful. I define a mystic as one who experiences the supernatural in a heightened way versus only by faith. And in that sense, I'm also a mystic. But, 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 going back to your point about the Eucharist being symbolic in a good way as the apex of his omnipresence, surely the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist is so supernatural and not the same kind of ontological presence God has in, say, a mosquito. And if this distinction is not made, then you have the teens in uh, post-Vatican II often preferring God's presence at the beach to his presence in the mass. And, but, 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 seeing scripture as normative really has really huge existential ethical consequences. Yes, but, suppose someone thinks contraception is never admonished in scripture and just comes out of some medieval anti-sex tradition, not knowing that the word, man, the, the word magic was forbidden and included the means of contraception in those days. So because they don't know the actual meaning of words in scripture, they can more easily think it's okay to use the pill because I felt so good when I used it for the first time to be able to have sex without worrying about babies. James, is it in scripture? Not the pill in those times, but it came under the name of magic, for it was considered magic that someone could stick different herbs in their wombs that would prevent the sperm from entering, and that was forbidden. And now, take premarital sex. It was called fornication. So when it's not translated, some people think adultery is forbidden, but that sex outside of marriage for singles isn't. James, I always thought that since I loved God, I should love the body he created and not violate its nature. Lunch. During the lunch, the seminar participants talked about insights into scriptures that came from historical exegesis. Um, I, well, someone says, I learned a lot when I understood why there were Jewish people all over the Roman Empire And that explains why legends such as that Mary lived in the company of St. John in Ephesus could have been true or that Mary Magdalene eventually lived in France as a hermitist. Another one said, I used to wonder about the response of Mary to the angel. How can this be known? How can this be since I know not man? After all, if you were engaged and expect soon to be married, you would be expecting to have a child. Then I learned about how Mary and Joseph were probably part of the Essene sect that encourages some married people to live in celibacy. Another one says, Seeing what crucifixion was actually really like, as Mel Gibson researched it for the movie The Passion, gave me this insight. The crucifixion is, in a way, the proof of the resurrection because what disciples who knew what it was 
really, really would risk us because what disciples who knew what it really was really like would risk such a thing unless they had seen Jesus resurrected. Adoration. Usually I'm pretty distracted during silent adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, but today I was too tired from the seminar to indulge in analytic thinking about projects or family problems. Instead, I opened to him from the bottom of my heart asking, Jesus, we need you so much in the church. You see how divided we are and what doubts assail us. Show us what you want of each of us in these troubled times. I felt a fiery yearning in my heart, but after a while, Jesus seemed to say to me, I am the Lord of my church. The hope and healing must come not from your debate, but from your heart. Do not speculate too much. Await my graces. Afternoon session was on roles, feminism versus complementarity. Father Doria, creator God, you chose to make us to be some male, some female. You gifted us with positive masculine and positive traits. After the fall, though, we also have many negative traits. Jesus and Mary and Joseph manifested all positive traits. They also surprise many by traits not always associated with their biological type. Jesus compared himself to a mother hen, and Mary uttered phrases about God casting down the mighty you would not expect of a housewife. Help us to explore our viewpoints about roles of men and women by avoiding limiting stereotypes but also to avoid culturally limited trends as well. Here are three theories about women's and men's roles in society and church prevalent in the past and still competing for attention in our times. I am only presenting very simple definitions. There are subtypes within these categories who disagree on important issues as issued today in the world and in the church. Complementarity. The theory that God created men and women to be different, and these differences lead to differing roles. Example, women having bodies capable of bearing and feeding babies are suited to be mothers. Men with stronger bodies are more suited for strenuous physical activity, such as hunting or construction. Men with a wider range of knowledge of the world around them are better as leaders and managers. Women closer to the heart are better at more personal activities such as nursing. These differences make them a good team. The theory of feminism, the theory that roles for the sexes were constructed in society for the benefit of men. Patriarchy leads to exploitation of women and should be overthrown. All roles should be open to everyone regardless of each one's sex. No discrimination should be accepted. Such roles include the priesthood, wholeness. All women have a masculine side and all men a feminine side. No traits are only for one sex and not another. It's limiting to have a division of roles. A good man needs to have many characteristics usually seen as feminine, such as being nurturing and compassionate. A good woman needs to be strong and intelligent. Here are your questions. One, how did you think of the roles of men and women in society in the church before becoming a graduate student of philosophy or theology? Two, did any stereotypes in the culture or the church impact your hopes and dreams? Three, what in your professional studies in this area do you consider to be most significant? Rhonda, James, I am sure I must have given you the book I wrote entitled Feminine, Free, and Faithful about just these topics, but I don't remember what you thought about it. James, since we are around the same age, my friend, you will understand that I only have a vague idea about that book of yours. I remember that I found it stimulating. I like to relate to the people I know as individuals rather than as exemplifications of theories. 
as a male child growing up in the South, I remember liking the way even strong men had soft voices. And even soft women could be powerful when it came to decisions in the family. Rhonda, in my case, I was brought up to be what would now be called feminist, so the term didn't exist then. I was always a strong talker, but I disliked that my mother wore wax before they became popular. She looked strange among other mothers of school children who wore pretty dresses. My heroines were my f mother's favorite actress, Catherine Hepburn, who was smart, but also Scarlett O'Hara, the seductress. James, I was certainly brought up to think that I could succeed at any masculine role I chose. And I will admit, I was surprised to find there were women philosophy and theology graduate students, expecting them instead to be in elementary education or nursing or secretarial work. Rhonda, I was uncertain about I wanted to do what I wanted to do professionally. Still in the late 1950s, I was not surprised when the guidance counselor at my college thought that no woman could be happy as a philosophy professor and I should look into something more satisfying, such as cooking. James, I don't think it was until way after Vatican II that we even talked about women as possible priests. After all, the sisters were leaders of school principals and hospital administrators, and the women's saints were such powerful personalities that they seemed dominant over many of the priests in their communities. When I teach about the doctors of the church, I love to recount how a priest of the Inquisition, after examining St. Teresa of Avila, remarked not only that she was orthodox, but also that she was a strong man. Rhonda, I like to challenge my students by pointing out that it was after Vatican II when many churches took out the statues of the saints, half of whom were women, and the huge pictures of Mary, Mother of God, that Catholics started talking about how masculine the church was. James laughing, but just the same, you can't think that having an all-male priesthood doesn't lead to such negatives as clericalism, paternalism, and women saying, thinking they have little to say in broader church directives. Rhonda, surprisingly for a woman professor, perhaps, I like having strong men in authority. It makes me feel secure. Surveys show that not only most men, but also most women prefer male speakers and professors to women in those roles. I think there is a contradiction built into the very word feminism. You would think it meant love of the feminine, but instead it means trying to be like men, and not only in traditional positive male traits such as strength and leadership, but in also by becoming negatively masculine, as in ruthless and domineering. I mean, what could be more ruthless than having your own baby killed by mostly male doctors in order to proceed with your own career? James, I would agree with most of what you say, Rhonda, but you seem to be leaving out a lot. Certainly women have been treated brutally all the way from wife beating to rape. Certainly they have been exploited for low rate wages throughout the whole world, and I doubt if women priests would be as prone to scandalous exploitation of minors as some male priests have been. Rhonda, if feminism means fighting oppressive actions of men with negative masculine traits, that part of it is good. John Paul II promoted what he called Christian feminism. But he still insisted that Jesus being the Son of God could not be represented by female priests. I like to ask doubters about this, whether you would have a famous male actor play the role of Mary in a nativity play in your parish. Dinner. Father Doria suggested that we relax at dinner by telling anecdotes about favorite Catholic women and men we had known well. It was refreshing. When I had my turn, I talked about a few dear people who combined positive traits of both sexes, leading to a lot of wholeness. My godfather was a German philosophy professor, Baldwin Schwartz, teaching in the U.S. He was extremely mild of temperament, but strong as can be in fidelity to the church and to all those he directed spiritually. 
A French friend of mine, also living in the U.S., is extremely good at efficient, prudent management of vast real estate holdings, but becomes absolutely compassionate in a motherly way whenever anyone is in pain. She is a wonderful counselor of pregnant women who comes to help at her pro-life maternity outreach. You, the reader, might want to think of how you would describe such family members or friends of your healing session, Father Doria. Before going into healing about feminine traits and roles, I want to read you this apt passage from many centuries ago concerning what we are to believe is absolutely real and normative coming from the New Testament. From a homily on the first letter to the Corinthians by St. John Chrysostom Bishop, the weakness of God is stronger than men. It is clear to unlearned men that the cross was persuasive. In fact, it persuaded the whole world. Their discourse was not of unimportant matters, but of God and true religion, of the gospel way of life and future judgment. Yet it turned plain, uneducated men into philosophers. How the foolishness of God is wiser than, his, than men and his weakness stronger than men. Paul had this in mind when he said, the weakness of God is stronger than men. That the preaching of these men was indeed divine is brought home to us in the same way. But how otherwise could 12 uneducated men who lived on lakes and rivers and wastelands get the idea for such an immense enterprise? How could men have, who perhaps had never been in a city or a public square think of setting out to do battle with the whole world? That they were fearful, timid men, the evangelist makes clear. He did not reject the fact or try to hide their weaknesses. Indeed, he turned these into a proof of the truth. What did he say to them? That when Jesus was arrested, the others fled despite all the miracles they had seen. While he who was the leader of the others denied him. How then counts for the fact that these men who in Christ's lifetime did not stand up to the attacks by the Jews set forth to do battle with the whole world once Christ was dead? if, as you claim, Christ did not rise and speak to them and rouse their courage? Did they perhaps say to themselves, what is this? He could not save himself, but he will protect us. He did not help himself when he was alive, but now whether he is dead, he will extend a helping hand to us. In his lifetime, he brought no nation under his banner, but by uttering his name, we will win the whole world. Would it not be wholly irrational even to think such thoughts, much less to act upon them? It is evident then that if he had not seen him risen and had proof of his power, they would not have risked so much. That uh, selection from John Christensen, my father of the church, is from the Office of Readings, August 24. Some of you might ask yourself, have I become so sophisticated in hermeneutics that I no longer see the path the doctors of the church saw so clearly? Mostly I thought it would be healing for you to take a look at this trait list. I know that this list is stereotypical, but just the same, I have found it useful in workshops I give on the subject of feminine and masculine. That's going back to the afternoon's topic. While the Doria handed out this page, both of you, men and women in this seminar, go through all these traits, feminine and masculine, and circle ones you think you usually display. Then go through all the positive traits of both sexes, putting a box around ones you wish you manifested more often. Here's positive feminine traits. Affectionate, caring, charming, compassionate, considerate, delicate, diplomatic, empathetic, enduring, Expressive, faithful, friendly, gentle, gracious, hospitable, intuitive, kind, nurturing, perceptive, polite, pure, quiet, sincere, soft, supportive, sweet, tender, trusting, warm. Negative feminine trait, catty, chatterbox, complaining, overly curious, overly dependent, overly emotional, fearful, flirtatious, 
gossipy, grudgy, hysterical, jumpy, manipulative, mean, moody, naggy, naive, passive, petty, pouty, prudish, seductive, overly sensitive, silly, slavish, smothering, spiteful, vain, weak, weepy, wishy-washy, positive masculine trait, adventuresome, assertive, authoritative, brave, chivalrous, daring, decisive, determined, driving, firm, focused, forceful, initiating, just, leading, logical, objective, protective, prudent, self-controlled, sporty, steady, straightforward, strong, and valiant. Negative masculine trait, overly ambitious, argumentative, blunt, brutal, callous, cold, competitive, condescending, daredevil, domineering, hiding of feelings, inconsiderate, insensitive, isolated, lustful, plotting, proud, rude, ruthless, sarcastic, self-centered, smugness, task-oriented, territorial, uncaring. After you've finished, pray about what you found. You might want to thank God for the good ones you have and repent of any negative ones. On those negatives, you might confess any that have hurt others. Especially consider negative traits that show themselves sometimes in your relationship to Catholics and other, part of the, and other parts of the spectrum. When I, Rhonda, did this exercise, I shamefully admitted that such negative feminine traits as cattiness, meanness, and spitefulness show themselves in arguments with opponents on church teaching. And even more were negative masculine traits such as argumentativeness, bluntness, pride, wanting always to be proved right publicly, and sarcasm. I decided to make my confession to Father Dorius since he has known me for so many years, I wouldn't have to come up with any examples for him to know just what I meant. I also recalled von Hildebrand contrasting the lax with the pharisaical and saying that the self-righteous Pharisee loves to hurl denunciations from the throne of truth, mea culpa. When I confess to loving one-upmanship and savoring perfect reputations of my opponents, Father Doria surprised me with this advice. Some people aren't ready for the truth, and no matter how well you express a truth, others may not be able to accept it. But Jesus always wants us to desire to love others, including enemies or opponents. Ask Jesus to help you desire to love everyone and the other parts of the spectrum. During the night, I woke up and remembered an image used by a spiritual teacher, a moral flimsy. Something flimsy is weak and easily destroyed. The context in which one of my co-authors, Sister Mary Neal O.P., used the term moral flimsy was this. A sinful person will often excuse, use excuses for her, his or her bad behavior. Another person exasperated by the denial then tries to demolish the excuses. That critic tries to tear off the moral flimsy of the sinner. Here's the point. I, Rhonda, exasperated by the denials involved in the theological opinions of my opponents on Catholic issues, want to tear off their moral flimsy through stinging sarcastic arguments. But if I pray to desire to love them more, How much better? Not that it isn't good for a philosopher and writer to advance good arguments for the truths of the faith, but always speaking the truth with love. So that's the end of that chapter. And may the Holy Spirit help you to take out of it things that might help you. Um, Now, if you're interested in these subjects, if, you, if any of these particular subjects, if you go back to the part of this website called On Route Books, you will see um, a whole thing called The Philosophical Spirituality of Rhonda Churvin, and you'll find a whole list of all the books I've written on different subjects, including these. And if you have questions, you could write me at my my, my um email, which is 
my name backwards. That is the last name first. Chervin, C-H-E-R-V-I-N, Rhonda, R-O-N-D-A, one word, lowercase. ChervinRonda at gmail.com. God bless you all. Pray for me. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.